So the last lecture we were introduced to the psychic reading and I want to recap again uh, some of what we went over to make sure the points came across well. So um, first thing I'm, I want to talk about was how many remember that Alan Alder uh, was interviewing the client I, who I, to whom I gave a palm reading. Uh, okay. Now, uh, where I put that up there was that the seemingly perplexity, you know, uh, Alan, who's a rational person, was obviously perplexed by this uh, lady's uh, reaction. Uh, he actually had brought her, uh, talked her into coming to my house, and he picked her to be the person for me to give the reading to. He landed in Eugene um, on a, I forget what, a certain a weekday night, and uh, then he spent the next three days with us, and uh, we did several things. Uh, but the first day he, night he landed in Eugene, he went to a rest, local restaurant, the Ambrosia, and she was a uh, she was a waitress there, and he got talking with her, and told him what he was doing uh, with this program. And she she said, "Oh, that's wonderful," because she's a skeptic, and she said she doesn't believe in any of this crap. So he thought that would be a good person to have me give a palm reading to. So he talked her into driving. So that's when you see her drive up uh, drive up my little cul-de-sac and. Um, knock on my door and enter. And uh, then I give, give her, read her palm. And, uh, and he interviews her afterwards, as you call, and says, how did he do? And she says, well, he it was very, very good because he told me things that no one could have known, you know, and uh, he was right on. And he told me things about, uh, actually, I am planning that way and stuff like that. So he says, so you've changed your mind now about this. She says, no, 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 I don't believe this at all. So he says, he says you don't believe there's anything to this? She says, no, no, I don't. And he kept pressing her, and we got a lot, most of it on, on not all of it, but most, you get the flavor of it on, on the show, that they, but we went on even longer. Uh, so she kept insisting that she doesn't believe it, but she believed that what I told her was things that I couldn't have known and no one else could have known about her, but were true. So you can get these inconsistencies. And what it means is that many times you're going to cross, uh, well, I've never met a strong uh, believer in the paranormal who didn't immediately begin by saying, I'm a skeptic too. I don't know if you ever met these people. But almost all the ones I ever get involved with, they, they say, I'm a skeptic too. Because some of them are clever or think they're clever by saying, well, I'm skeptic of, about skepticism. They, they, they bring that up as well. There are websites about that. But, these people think they are skeptics as well, many of them. And also, some people can be consistently thinking that uh, they don't believe in the paranormal, but if you question them, what they do believe in is what we would call paranormal. So what seems a contradiction to us and, make, and to Alan, I guess, was uh, maybe not a contradiction. That's one of the reasons I brought that up. So you can get this, these interesting uh, uh, things that come out of doing readings. The other thing I want to remember, I want to remind you of was the, um, on the program called Superpowers, uh, where there was this radio psychic, now he's on, on the web, he does all kinds of other stuff, Christian Dion. And the one reason they brought me to London, basically, was they wanted me, and you see me in the uh, control room there of the radio station a few times, taking notes, and while he's giving his reading. He came, by the way, he came to the uh, radio station uh, in a Rolls Royce. He wasn't driving, his chauffeur drives it. It's a, quite a show. He comes in, I thought he was from um, um, uh, Aladdin in the 40 Thieves or something like that, because he comes in wearing silk pantaloons. <laughs> and uh, unbelievable. The, the whole thing is a quite a show. This is a radio program. But, uh, <laughs> They, they, uh, you saw the receptionist there who takes the calls and screens them. She told me that when Christian Dion was on, they, he was on once a week, I guess, uh, for a few hours. And he's on, uh, the, the, big, the, the audience trying to get in, get, get a meeting on, is the biggest audience at that time of any kind of 
a program in, in British Isles. So he was quite popular then. He's, if, I, 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 if you go to the web, you can see he still, I don't know if he still has his radio program in, in London. But that show was also a source of revenue for him in the sense that this was good advertising for him. In fact, he did, his, uh, did advertise on the show. And we got permission to go to one of the people who told me gave a reading. Remember this uh, lady? I, I went to her house. She lived in West London, and we drove out to her house. And, and it was interesting. I guess the whole street, <laughs> though she lived, everyone was hanging out the windows watching us as we uh, drove up the street as if they'd never seen a television uh, crew before. I don't know. And then they had me go to the door and knock, and, and she lets me in. And believe it or not, we did 10 takes of that. They wanted to get it just right. So I had to walk in, knock on the door, she go, I open it, and I say, hello, <laughs> and it, uh, are you Yvonne? And, and so on. We did that several times. And then we went out to her back, uh, and that's where I interviewed her. And you see me interviewing her, and one of the things I begin with, remember I said, Yvonne, uh, how, do you, how was that meeting you got? She said, oh, it was wonderful, it was fantastic, you know. And then I say, try to pin her down, I said, okay, what exactly was it that he told you that made it such a wonderful reading? And she had to hesitate, but then she said, he told me I lost my sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's, <laughs> it was a wonderful thing. I, I, I hope I can use that in the future. I, 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 <laughs> but as, as DJ was saying, that has absolutely no content at all, right? Almost. <laughs> and, but by the way, he was, it could sound be negative even, but she was that impressed her. She said, you know, of all the things she said that was a great reading and everything else, of all the things he said to her, that I pressed her some more, and then she said, well, he also told me about, uh, uh, you know, he told us, he said something, I see something about property matters. She translated that. Now, property matters could cover all kinds of things, you know, uh, a manuscript that they try to sell to the publisher, you know, could cover everything. She said, well, my husband and I have talked in the past about maybe selling our house in the future. So he was right on that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so, well, that was the gist of that. I just wanted to let you know that uh, it doesn't take much to get uh, people impressed. And what, what impresses them can be very surprising, uh, especially if it's the sparkle. <laughs> now, the other thing is uh, I wanted uh, what we saw Randy do this demonstration. Where, uh, and I want to talk about that because the guy uh, that really is basing his demonstration on is a man named Ben Forer, F-O-R-E-R. And so, uh, and what happened was we went over Kreider, right, the man who, uh, the 1944, the psychologist who studied this character reading, he brought him to his, her, her, her to his class and had to give a reading to each of his students, and 96% of the statements were rated by the students as accurate of themselves, okay? He thought that was tremendous, and psychology got to rethink about <coughs> psychic phenomena and everything else like that as a result. Well, Benjamin Forer happened to read, uh, some years later, read uh, this paper by Kreider, and he was a little uh, dubious about this. Uh, in a sense that uh, you looked at those sample readings, I gave you one, right? You, you saw it, and he says, this doesn't make any sense, and he's, he didn't do it right anyways. And so Fora did a clever variation of it for his experiment. Fora actually got his statements. Uh, he went to, um, uh, he said he went to uh, newsstand astrology magazines back in 44 and just clipped out sentences from them and made a set of statements uh, which um, I wish I had a copy with me of his set. I, I, I know I put it in the, uh, in the um, I did a manuscript of, uh, for uh, on cold reading which uh, we handed out every time I give a workshop on it and uh, the JREF uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation is thinking of uh, putting that out. Is that right? Making it available or in some form or other. It's an 85-page document, which 
the way I put the thing is it gives you everything you need to know about cold reading. Ray, would you like to I could print out the four effect right now for you. Yes, could you do that? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, he's going to print, uh, print out the four statements. Uh, the four statements consist of a set of, I think, about 24 statements, which he picked out of an astrology magazine in 1944. And here's what he did with it. He had a class, he's a professor, and uh, in those days you could do things, anything you want to do with your classes, so he gave him what he said was a new personalities test he's working on, basically. And he gave him the test, and the next week he handed every student in the class a printed paragraph. He said, this is the reading, uh, this is the, uh, now you can call it reading, this is the uh, analysis that we got from the test of you based on your responses to the test. And he said, I want you to do three things with this. I want you to look at read it over and rate on a scale from one to five, five being perfect, one being not so good. Okay. So he gave him just a scale of one to five. I want you to rate on a scale of one to five how good you think the test is on the basis of the reading you got from it, or the description, uh, personality description got for on yourself. And roughly, uh, 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 I won't give you exact statistics, but almost everyone put it a five and a few put a four. And I think only one or two went down to a three. So everyone thought this was a great test based on what they got. The second thing he did is said, now I want you to give an overall rating on how well the description you got fits you using the same scale one to five. Again, most people gave it five, and some gave it four, and she gave it three. Then he said, I want you to go through each of, oh, oh, thank you. I want you to go through each of the statements and, uh, okay, this is the whole thing. I mean, they usually, it was, each, he had them separated out as separate sentences. I want you to, um, I want to, I'll put this up here so you can read it, see it for yourself. This is the uh, thing, he, he put it, we had each sentence was just a separate line in his paragraph. That's, but this is what each student got to read. This is what they're reading. And then he had him read each of the statements separately uh, as to whether it's true or false of themselves. Okay, and again, they were overwhelmingly, they were rated true. And of course, as you can know, everyone got the same statement without knowing it. This is the point of his thing. This is the, this is the part that uh, Kreider missed. Many people missed, by the way. And, and this one of the reasons cold meetings work and stuff like that is that people, this, and it's the same reason I brought up the point about the dog that didn't bark in the night. People focus on what is and not on the alternatives. So what Kreider missed was how well, how, he got 96% of the statements that were given to his students, accepted by them. But the question is how, how much, what percentage would be accepted by people for whom the statements weren't meant? You know, if you gave these same statements for each student to someone else and told them this is meant for you, how many would they accept? You need that as a baseline, as a proper comparison. So everyone gets this one. They all think you're getting a personalized one. And given that, you get a, a higher rating, a very spikingly high rating, and uh, people accept this as true themselves. What Randy did his thing was he had people in hand their uh, reading to, to the person behind him. So everyone now gets, uh, and, and, and people suddenly saw the same thing they got before and they realized what was going on. And you can see what kind of things, so his is a little more sophisticated than, uh, uh, than Kreider's, because Kreider had a lot of statements, you remember, that were things like, uh, your digestive organs are normal, uh, you have two feet, uh, almost that, that weight and stuff like that. So it's quite obvious, you know, like that. but this one is a little more subtle, but still, it works very well. Now, the interesting thing was, Randy used in his demonstration, he's doing many, many years later, uh, over 50, oh, this, okay, yeah. He's using uh, over 50 years, uh, how many is that? From 40 to, yeah, it's about 50 years later, half a century later, the same statements 
still works just as well. And I just I know I've done it in classes and stuff like that. You can use that same set of statements even today, and they work. You know the culture changes and stuff like that. Um, I was telling DJ this morning uh, also about a man named Lee Earl, who's a uh, uh, a magician mentalist. He also markets materials for other magicians, and he marketed a, a system for doing cold readings, which you had to pay a lot of money for. To get out. And it's, he used this is it. He gave him he said, <laughs> and he said, "Now, if you want to." Uh, but if you're giving it for groups of people, like uh, here, several people, or people coming into your booth at a fair, uh, they're going to go out and talk to other people. You want, you, it's going to sound bad if they remember a lot of what they said, and you tell your friend, and they, and they call and say, well, he told me I'm disciplined and self-control on the outside. He told me worrisome and insecure inside. He told me at times I have sick, serious doubts. So if they remember some of that, it's not going to sound good. Everyone realizes they, everyone's getting the same message, right? So he tells you that the way you handle this is that you give, uh, you take different samples, like a four, uh, let's say one, uh, two, three, four, the first four, you give it to the first person, the next person you give the next four, the next person, then if you got even more, you take, uh, you, you take the sampling from, let's say, the top line, and the second one, you go to the alternate one. So everyone's getting a different combination of these things, and that will hide any thought. But in fact, that's actually pretty good advice as I, when I tell you about how Christian I own works, okay? Recently, I was asked to give a class of college freshmen a chance to evaluate one of the oldest systems of fortune telling, astrology. Well, you know, I started life as a, as a magician. I still am a magician, I guess. I think it's in the DNA. I'm not too sure. But. Uh, I'm an actor playing the part of a wizard. I know how people are deceived. I know how they deceive themselves. And many magicians, most magicians, really allow people to deceive themselves. Would you like to see me fool you? Yeah. Who's wearing a wristwatch here? A regular, ordinary wristwatch. <laughs> mm. You've been a good girl, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> Let's just say, oh, I thought it was a Rolex for a minute. Oh, well. <laughs> now, what time does it say on your watch? It says nine minutes before three, and it says it's the 2nd of October, right? Very good. Open up your hand for me, flat like that. The clean one. She almost changed, you know that? Almost changed. Now, I'm going to put the watch face down your head. Put your finger of your other hand on the back of the watch, okay? There we good. Now, my watch says nine minutes to three, so we disagree slightly, but not enough for any never mind. Okay, watch what happens now. I'm really concentrating now. Oh, I think I hurt myself. <laughs> Don't laugh, this is science. Let me see now, holding it only by this. Oh, would you tell the folks what time it says on your watch now, please? <laughs> it says 3.40. But 3.40, how time flies when you're having fun. Isn't that wonderful? Now, let me show you something. This is such a little tiny itty bitty watch. Here, hold it tightly in your hand. Don't lose. Oh, my oh. goodness. Uh, uh, what happened? Oh, the gentleman was carrying it over here behind his waist and he didn't even know it. There you go. Wait, you wait, have your watch. The trickster never works alone. His audience assists him. If he does his job well, they want to be fooled. Uh, Sherla? You pass that back, <coughs> Wendy. Let's For the astrology go. test, each student was given a detailed horoscope. Robin, did you pass it over? To Robin? They were told it was drawn up by a professional based on information they had supplied about when and where they were born. <laughs> Actually, these horoscopes were not quite what they appeared to be. I'd like you to share something with me, if you'd be so kind, just with a show of... I asked the students to grade them for accuracy on a scale of one to five, five being the most accurate. Uh, how many gave it a one? Let's see a show of hands. Two, three, four, and five. Okay, so we scored pretty highly with this set. Let's do a little experiment. You've got your horoscopes right in front of you. Take them in your hand like this and hand them over your shoulder to the person behind you. Okay, everybody, and the guy at the end down there, you'll have to come up to the front because these people in the front don't have one now. Okay, everybody change them around. Everybody's got a horoscope. Open up somebody else's horoscope and read it carefully, please. Oh, 
Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> they had all received the same horoscope. The personality descriptions were generally true of everyone, like recently you have had to recover from a disappointment. Some of them seem specific because they were so personal. Your sexual adjustment has presented some problems for you. And there were others that anyone might hope would be true. You have a great deal of unused capacity. People like to believe certain things are true. And they like to fall for very specific, absolutely, enormously accurate horoscopes, right? Right. Of course they are. Did you have a question? Yes, I have a question. So why do people persist in uh, ascribing to these systems? That's the big question, of course. And psychologically, that is the most interesting question. I think that people are trying to get some control over their lives. By knowing more about themselves, of course, they get control over their lives. But that's what we're doing, all of us, each and every day of our lives. Whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's a love interest, whether it's health, we're trying to get control of our lives, we're looking for power, and astrology offers you apparently a very old and a very easy formula whereby you can do that sort of thing. What you've presented me today is evidence that this can be misused or abused, but you have not convinced me that there is nothing to this. Oh, no, no, I didn't intend to do that. Okay, and, and I feel that your exercise today was kind of cynical and one-sided, and somehow it is wise to be um, unbelieving in this. Well, I can't prove it doesn't work. I and, can never prove it doesn't work. And I've work. seen it a lot of times where intellectuals have, had, have wanted to disprove mystical things because since it didn't fit into their framework of beliefs, That's they, true. they wouldn't allow it. But I can't prove to you that Santa Claus doesn't exist. I really can't. I can't disprove anything. I can't prove a negative. But I can show you that it's not very likely to be true. That's the best I can do. This last, this last fellow is, uh, we were discussing things, uh, some of us after the lectures yesterday, we at dinner, and um, Ed, was not here, but Ed asked us to uh, ask the question of me. Uh, you know, the principle of charity covers a bit. I told you we should be using the principle of charity. That's part of our, our framework. And violating someone else's claim. And you remember that principle is that comes from philosophy, is if you're attacking or dealing with someone's claim, try to rephrase it so that it's in its strongest uh, statement. If you want to attack someone's argument, if you're going to attack it at its best, not at its worst. And uh, Ed said, well, what, what are you dealing with an outright charlatan? <laughs> well, what are you dealing with, you know, certain kinds of people? Uh, and this is an interesting question. I, I, I'm, I've Geller, I want to argue with Geller, and I've been with him several times. I wouldn't, just, I wouldn't use principal charity on because it's useless, <laughs> right? I just, you don't argue with them. It's not, not, it's not going to get you anywhere anyway. So I'm not sure, but I'm not sure I would try to use any kind of rationality on this gentleman. He's not, there's not, no way I, I can figure out how you're going to disabuse him, right? And, and, and then an eth there's an ethical question. Maybe he's happy with his uh, weird system of belief system and uh, you might want to think, okay, it's not ethical. Uh, maybe it's ethical of you to disabuse them because this is not consistent with good science. And if everyone in our government and the rest in our country had this approach to the world, uh, our already abysmal science uh, education would be zero, I guess, by now. Uh, but maybe, on the other hand, maybe as an ethical thing, we should think of ways of getting to that person. But we have the ethical right to change them. That's an interest. And I, I don't know. I, I, I don't try to think of that too much because it, it makes me unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but people change. Oh, yes, they do, but not for the right reasons. Yeah, but not for the right reasons. Uh, I always find it fascinating. Ever since I came into the world of uh, skepticism, so I've, I've always been a skeptic. So I've never had the pleasure or the, uh, of, of having first been believing all this stuff, 
I never had a belief in my life, a, you know, paranormal or a spiritual belief of any kind in my life. I never had felt that. And I sort of now envy those who've had that pleasure. Uh, and, um, but many of the people who do come to my workshops, many of the skeptics I've, worked, I, I, I've met, uh, I'd say the majority of them at least, have come from the other world. In other words, they have had an epiphany that something has told them that, hey, this is all crazy. They grew up in a, um, a very fundamentalist environment and they believe all kinds of things and they believe about the, that Noah not only had the ark, but it was only a few years ago and that kind of business. Uh, and they suddenly, bang, something came along and they changed and they now became skeptical. I know only a few cases, very few cases, I know of a few cases, of people going the other way. And there at least one person, he used to belong to the Magic Castle, I remember, and a few times he used to come down to the Magic Castle, I used to meet him. He was a good friend of Jerry Anderson's. But he was a militant atheist, and almost any opportunity he had, every excuse he would get, and get up and make a tirade against religion and all that kind of stuff. So he was really, I don't know that. One day, I, I was, back here visiting in Los Angeles for some reason gave me a talk and we got together. I won't tell you his name, cause, but I do remember his name. And he got, we got together and in fact he took me to lunch at the Magic Castle. And he wasn't gung-ho military. He seemed very, very mild about the person. He seemed to be okay with his life. And it turned out that he now was dating a lady from the Salvation Army. And then, then he mentioned they married. And now he has very little, maybe he still comes to Magic Gas, I don't know, but, but he no longer discusses religion with anyone, stuff like that. And he doesn't seem to be, I don't know if he's gone the other side, but he's certainly not militantly against it. And I don't know if you other people who also gone, only a few other cases, they've gone from being a skeptic to being a believer. I would like to be able to do, be able to do some kind of a survey, scientific, if you could be it scientifically, to find out who, get the people, a lot of people who converted to skepticism, and see if you can find how many people who've gone the other way, and do some, start trying to figure out what is it that did it, in both, either case. By the way, I don't think the conversion that I know of, either way, was necessarily a rational change. They seem to be almost a flip-flop. <coughs> And the ones I know especially, I had a colleague, uh, Bob Fogo, who shared the office. He unfortunately died of uh, Alzheimer's recently. But Bob was a very good psychologist, uh, but, but he came from New Orleans, uh, and he grew up as a um, very uh, uh, devout Catholic. And one day, apparently, he had this epiphany and suddenly became an anti-Catholic. But he wasn't just dropped Catholicism, he was a militant anti-Catholic. And every time he thought he had the excuse he could, even in the middle of a scientific conversation, he'd get up and make a tirade against Catholicism, okay? And I met a lot of people like that who flipped from being Catholics to being militant anti-Catholics. Uh, so when people switch to being skeptics or being on one side or the other, it isn't always obvious that it's a, for good reasons, rational reasons. This is something, it's an, I know it's inside, there, but it's related, so let, it's okay, I can take off that. Let's go on now with this further thing here, because I want to make a point about this as well. Needless to say, my message isn't always popular. My friend Ray Hyman is a psychologist, and he has an idea why. We seem to be uh, taken as we're taking something away and not giving something yes. in return. Yes. And these people want something, they're looking for something, and I think we have to understand what is it they're searching for and what they're seeking. And Ray has an insider's perspective on these questions. He once worked as a professional palm reader. On a recent visit to Florida, he allowed me to observe while he gave readings to two volunteers. Now, I want to look at a few other things before we go very far. I look at your thumb, which is the most important. Ray started reading palms to help put himself through college. There's a little narrowing of the second joint here. That's, that's tact. That suggests tactfulness. At the time, he was convinced there was nothing to it. Uh, this is the spiritual, mental. I had no belief that it would work. But to be convincing, I did read the books, and I did study the lines the way, and told it as it's supposed to be told. And to my surprise, it worked. And then it became a very rapid believer in palm reading. 
there is a break in your lifeline. This is your lifeline right here. So you've had some physical problems. You still may have some problems here, some medical problems of some sort. You he was right about that, that I had had some health problems. Is there anything there about my mother? About your mother. Uh, the one thing, that, the, the thing that's clear is that uh, right from the beginning, uh, you didn't want to be dominated by her. You want to make up your own mind about what your life is going to be like and so on. I have been uh, very headstrong when it comes to my mother. She has kind of tried to dominate me sometimes, and I've rebelled against it. At the same time, you wanted to be, you wanted to be on your own terms and stuff like that. A he's pretty right on the money with a lot of things. Maybe he's got some part to himself that others are not in touch with, and he knows yeah, these things. Turned about the relationship between your mother and yourself. As a palm reader, Ray was yeah, quite successful. I was saying. Then a college friend bet him that he would do just as well if he told his subjects the opposite of what he read in their palms. He decided to give it a try. And I did this on my first client, and she didn't say a word. She had no reaction at all, which was very spooky to me because I'm used to feedback. Um, I thought it was because I bombed, but it turned out because she was so stunned, I was so accurate. And this was really a shock to me because I had done everything wrong, so I did it the next client wrong. And then I realized it doesn't make any difference what you tell them, it's more what you convince them, how good you are, and what you get them to believe. As, to what As a professional psychologist, and Ray and is very much aware of the role that careful observation can play in a reading. You're living in a strange world. Uh, you'd be better if you're living maybe 50, 40 years ago in some ways. <laughs> I've always said that. I should have been born a long time ago. This pr present world is, is presents problems for you, and you're not too happy with it. You would be much and more from the way she was dressed and so on, I could say that she'd rather be living in, in an earlier time than today. In fact, she was dressed for an earlier time anyway. There's a change. There has been, uh, there for a while, looked like you had two jobs or two careers. I'm not sure. And uh, very recently, you have switched. In fact, there's been a major career change. Um, I've been in the same career for six years. Next year, I'm thinking about changing careers, but I haven't done it yet. So he could just be a little off in his timing. If you set people up right, you can tell them most uh, anything. If they really got a creative and intelligent mind, they can make sense out of it, no matter how crazy it seems to be. They can find a way of, of, of reinterpreting it so that it really fits them like a glove. This person wants me to succeed. Uh, she'll work out some accommodation. I'm showing, I'm showing you this is that because uh, since I stopped doing professional palm reading, you know, getting people to pay for it. Most of my readings, and been a lot, have been in public forums, like on television or on radio, where I'm playing the part of a psychic. And uh, if you think about it, it's a different area, area you know. Um, when I'm, let's go, uh, before I talk about, I'll make that point, let's go to the very first one. The, the one on the Shirley show. What year was that, by the way? Uh, 90. Okay, this was uh, Shirley, this was in Canada. Shirley, at the same time as Phil Donahue in this country, had the, sort of a talk show type of thing, and Shirley was the equivalent of Canada. She was the big talk show person here, and that's her. And this is the Shirley show. She decided she was going to have a, um, uh, on her show one time, a, uh, one of Canada's premier astrologers but what was special about this premier astrologer, he specialized in horses. He was an astrologer to horses. Okay. Uh, it was a good living because, you know, uh, there are a lot of rich people uh, in Canada, not too many rich people, but the, the ones that are rich have a lot of money and they own these horses for racing and stuff like that. It's very important that uh, they know that they, the horse is compatible with the jockey who's going to ride them and the horse is going to be uh, a winner and that kind of thing. And uh, so. Uh, he made his full-time living doing horoscopes for horses. That was his specialty. Now, he isn't the first animal uh, uh, astrologer that I knew of. When I was growing up, there used to be something called the uh, Saturday Evening Post magazine. Uh, some of you, if you're old enough to remember that, you're very old, okay. But it was a weekly, and uh, it had cartoons. And I, I knew it. I, I used to get it because I was trying to also be a cartoonist. I would send cartoons into them and hope they would uh, print my cartoons. 
uh, and did pay me from, of course. But anyway, it's one issue that's sad to even post. I, no, this is not sad to post. See, I, I got it a little bit wrong. It was Life Magazine, which also doesn't exist anymore. It was an issue of Life Magazine. I think I still saved the clipping. There was a guy named, I remember his name now, it was Beck. His name was, last name was Beck, anyway. And he was uh, featured as the, the astrologer. Uh, he specialized in dogs. Uh, so he was the first person I knew who was, was there, and he was in Hollywood, and he was making a fantastic living because whenever he, Hollywood style wanted to get a dog or something like that, he would do the horoscope for the dog and the, and the uh, star or the person going to buy the dog and see whether they're going to be compatible or not, stuff like that. And this was a good living. Anyway, so this is a horse astrologer. And this, the, so she had me on there, and I'm not sure how I was going, whether she's going to have me give a cold reading to a horse, because she wanted to compare me with the <laughs> cold reading with the, what the astrologer does. Fortunately, I didn't have to, we didn't do it, have to do it with horses, but anyways, this is the context of how I got flown there to do this program. Go ahead. ...who believe in it are wasting their time and wasting their money. Ray Hyman is an international authority on astrology. Robin Armstrong is a professional astrologer. Bob Garrison also studies the stars, but he's not an astrologer. He's actually an astronomer. Mark Pecora is an astrologer who casts the charts for the powerful and famous. And David Gower has been the editor of an astrology magazine as well as an astrology column. So we have a fantastic panel here for you. And we're going to start off, uh, t we're going to meet some people, because uh, let me begin to, by telling you that, we're, that with Ray and Robin, now Ray and Robin, have, are they all have different styles, astrologers. Some are kind of on the spot. There you go, I've got it for you. And people like Robin take hours and hours poring over charts, you know, so they can tell us what they have to tell us. So we have chosen in this audience a few people. We gave you, Robin, some background information. Not very much, but we'll begin with Ray, because you are on an on-the-spot kind of guy. Let me introduce you to our first person, okay? This is Janine Fawcett. Now, Hi, what do you need to know from Janine? When she was born. January 16, 1954. Do you know what time of day? Uh, it was between 5.30 and 6 a.m. Uh, January. Okay, and um, okay, where were you born? That's the only other thing I need to know. Uh, Keswick, Ontario. Okay, now I, uh, I obviously haven't cast a horoscope or anything, and so I have to make some adjustments, and that's what I'm trying to do in my head, like a lightning calculator in a sense and trying to anticipate some things. First of all, you surprised me. You weren't what I expected uh, from the birth date. I would have predicted quite a different one, so I'll be honest with you. Uh, what I do get is, um, uh, I get this feeling that there's two separate things going on within you from, from my, my anticipation. Two separate things in a sense. Uh, you are trying to deal, you basically are a conservative person uh, you basically uh, would like to be oriented towards and acknowledge your maternal, nurturant, um, uh, even feminine aspect. On the other hand, uh, you're in a different world today. It's a world where there's a challenges there, and the challenges are to uh, be something else. Okay, let, let me stop you there and, and ask you, Janine, how accurate Ray has been so far. Oh, he's pretty accurate. Really? Well, good, good stuff. Okay, let's, let, let me go on now to Ron. And uh, Ron, if I could just ask you to sit down for a moment, Janine. Okay, now, this is Ron, and uh, what do you need to know? Same, Same thing, birth, when he was born? November 5th, 1969. Okay. And I was born in Ottawa, Ontario. Ottawa, Ontario. Do you know what time of day you were born? Uh, between 6 and 7 a.m. in the morning. Okay, you do fit a little bit. Uh, um, the term, term that comes to me is rebel. I don't know if you remember the movie Rebel Without a Cause. Yeah, I've heard of it. I'm a film student. Okay, good. <laughs> you know about Dean, okay? And the reason it occurs to me is, is in a sense that I get the impression that your problem is, your problem was, and maybe still is, that uh, how to cope with your parents. Uh, very early on, there was this constraints, and you were, you were chafing at the constraints with your parents. Uh, is that true? Well, maybe when I was really young. Yeah, okay. Under six, I think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the real problem for you now is uh, career-wise, and fortunately you did tell me your career, 
but uh, for you, uh, maybe it's a, it's a good career that you're choosing. I would have anticipated that uh, your problem today would be uh, whether to settle in in a conventional type of career and stay with it, or whether to be what is in your nature, to be on the outside and challenging and questioning what is going on there. Okay, now, how is he doing? Close. I'm, I'm thinking a lot now. A lot of thinking. Did anyone make any comments so far on any of this, by the way? You were cool, man. You were so <laughs> cool. Um, not letting him shake you at all? I've had a long experience that. Not to mention the for professor. But remember, this, this, is not, this is not the same thing, though, as doing private readings. When I'm doing private readings, I'm alone with that person. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole, the whole um, that person is, is everything that which makes the reading, reading so powerful, that person is the center of attention. The whole reading is on that person. Remember I told you about uh, Tom Waters who wrote about uh, a party where, uh, at Stanford where uh, Jerry Andrews did this wonderful magic and then I followed up by doing some palm reading because I was asked to do it and everyone just talked about the palm reading and Jerry's great magic was, 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 was secondary. And he wanted to make the point was that doing cold readings is fabulous. Like you, can't, can't, you can't beat it with magic or anything else because you're dealing with the person. This is them. Whereas when you're doing magic, you, the magician's the center of attention. And these people are out there being fooled or something like that, but they're not. So, uh, so when you're doing private readings, the person's the center of attention. Now, public readings are, you know, it dawned to me, um, I'm giving you, uh, we've been giving you, and if you uh, people take my uh, workshops on cold reading, they get lots of ploys, lots of how to set the client up, how to, you know, what you do before the reading is very, is even more important than what you do during the reading. And uh, and then during the reading, how to do it and what, in the script and how to do the scan that we taught you that time. And um, uh, then after the reading, there are several things that I teach you and that are, that, that, that are good ploys that a good cold reader can use to make the reading even more powerful. Most of that is not available when you're sitting and doing this on a tele, private, a public uh, podium. When you do it on the radio, as you saw me do on the um, uh, opposite Christian, in, uh, uh, imitating uh, or trying to duplicate what Christian I own was doing, and you see me on things like that, uh, first of all, I can't use, I don't have the time to set up. I can't do a scan like you pay, people had. I didn't have that time to do that. And I, I, suddenly she picks a person for me and suddenly I just have to go, right? And it's always amazing to me that I go. <laughs> and it works most of the time. Uh, it seems like the others have time to benefit from your... Oh, yeah. Okay. That's true. And, but anyway, so it's a different thing. I call minimalist reading, I compared to the, what I consider the real private reading. The re real one is where you got the person, you are alone, it's between you and the, and the, and the client. Uh, in this situation, uh, there's a, a, a sort of a pull between, should you be trying to convince that person you can read to that, that you're so great that you're hitting them, or do you do what John Edward and other people do? Don't even worry about the person you've been reading to. You're trying to convince the other people. Uh -oh. Yeah. So, so John Edward, you know, when he's on Larry King Live and so forth, it's very frustrating. Most of the time, they don't even ask the ask the person got person got the reading. Was that a good reading or something like that? They just switch because they don't give a damn about that. They want they're interested. They're trying to interest all the all the people are watching. Uh, so there's an interesting conflict there. Do you, who do you go for? What do you shoot for? And sometimes they they're not. Uh, compatible all the time. But yet, despite all that, I don't, you don't have the chance to, you know what you're going to come across. Despite all that, I've never bombed. <laughs> I did one time. There was a lady, uh, I know she still does it, uh, uh, her name is Worthy, last name, and she had her own production, TV production company, that made independent films that they would try to sell to PBS and or, or to other stations. That's how she made a living. She and her, actually a daughter, and they worked in San Francisco doing stuff. And she got this idea one time that 
to do a, a, a program where she would get five psychics, the top psychics in the Bay Area, and each of them would give a reading to that same person. She'd get one person, they, each, each psychic in turn would give a half hour reading, which is a long reading, by the way. That's a long one. And half hour reading. And then she'd get me to give a reading as well. And the idea was she was hoping for that my reading would be the best one to show up these psychics, right? The real psychics, the phony one, uh, gets, gets, gets a better hit. Well, that one, in one sense, I bombed, and maybe that's why she, I don't know what she was doing with the program. Uh, but what happened was uh, she had already do this lady, and she only had one client, which is risky, you know, because just putting all your eggs in a basket with just one person getting a reading. Uh, uh, so when I came down, I, she, she, it was wonderful because she put me up in a nice little hotel right next to the theater in, uh, in the theater district of uh, San Francisco, and um, the Phantom of the Opera was playing, and she had, gave me a front row seat to the Phantom of the Opera. It was fantastic. And so I was feeling very well while I was there. Uh, and uh, she also, interestingly, as a side effect, because I mentioned Conan Doyle already uh, in, in previous things, she, uh, and it, uh, maybe it's still there, I think maybe it probably is. She was responsible for setting up a Arthur Conan Doyle, a Sherlock Holmes room in the top floor of the Hilton Hotel in San Francisco. And maybe it's still there. If you go up to the top floor there, there is a room to uh, be like a Sherlock Holmes room in Baker Street with the, uh, the artifacts and stuff like that that he would have in his room. This was supposed to be a simulation of that. It's called the Sherlock Holmes room. And uh, so she was responsible for that. She would go to Europe every year in her own, on her own money and time, I guess, and, and collect new stuff to put into that room. Like, um, the violin that Sherlock Holmes used to play when he talked and some of his uh, drug paraphernalia and that kind of stuff. Anyway, I just, this is background to this. So my job was when she got me they got me onto the studio, was this lady that had been given now a reading by four others, five other psychics, and now I'm getting her, I'm the last one to give her a reading. And again, that raises some interesting questions. Would it be better to be in the middle, or should I be before that? You know, these are all the interesting questions, which you can second guess. But, uh, and also, you're have, going to have to give her a half hour reading, and she didn't want me to use pound reading. She just wanted me to sit there and just look at her and talk, which is also not my standard way. Okay. So that was all. Then, then, I, then I had to make in my own mind, uh, how should I play this? You know, it was just one person. And if you pick the person at random, I would say, well, it's probably someone I should not, and the other people are being psychics and new psychic type stuff, woo-woo stuff, I'm going to come across as non-woo-woo. So I spent the first 50 minutes and then I stopped it at, at, for a break because they then changed the, the tapes and so on and then we came back and did, went, did the remaining 15 minutes. Uh, I did the 15 minutes, we talked about things. I tried to ass assess her. She was very well dressed. She had expensive jewelry, no question about it. This was someone who had a lot of money. But she looked about, she could have been about 30, but I guess uh, with all that money, she probably was much older and, and used money to make sure she was going to be forever looking young with cosmetic surgery and that kind of business. And by the way, I'm writing all that, it turns out. <laughs> I don't tell that, but I use that to, okay, I'm just, I did my scan, you know, and stuff like that. So she's attractive, she's older than she looks, she, uh, so I know some things about her just by doing that. And I told her a lot about the stuff, so it seems to me I didn't have much trouble doing this. Um, and then we had the break. And uh, Willow, her name is Willow Worby. Willow comes, comes to grabs me during the break and takes me aside and says, Ray, you're bombing, you're terrible. I, I said, what do you mean? She says, this gal, now she tells me for the first time, this lady, she's into the psychic. She, she's heavily into psychic things and everything else. All the other psychics, you know, use spiritual language, they, they do stuff, you know, what psychics do, and they, uh, and they're dressed apart. You're dressed in a suit, <laughs> with a tie, you don't look like a psychic. And, and you're not talking like a psychic, you're talking like a psychologist. I said, well, I am a psychologist. But yeah. <laughs> she says, but, but you gotta change during the second, so the second half, uh, okay, I now did my woo-woo stuff. <laughs> I did my best imitation I could of a, of a, of a psychic, a true psychic. I got 10 minutes, for, okay. 
So I uh, did my thing, and uh, well, and I think it, the second half I did, I was very good, and that that was compelling. But as a whole, she picked the first, very first psychic as the best, and it turned out. Uh, by the way, the crew now knew knew all about her, everyone else, and 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 they, and they were also making their own judgments about what was going on. They picked me as the most accurate, the only one who was even close to being accurate. All the others were way off. Turns out. She was very, she was about 40, 40-ish or something, uh, maybe a little more older, but had, was very well, well healed, had lots of money, and, uh, but had, was in a depression, that's why she got into the psychic world. She was looking for some help because she uh, was told she never could have children. And this was really a big thing with her. The others told her, and the psychic that she picked actually told her she could have children. She was going to have children, saw lots of children, and all that kind of stuff. And um, the others took, also took her as, as young as what she was trying to portray herself. The others took her that way. And I was, I, I, I was quite accurate. I actually, everything was right, right. So in one sense, I was more accurate. And everyone agreed I was the only one who was even close to being accurate. I was the most accurate of all the psychics. But she picked the first one as the best. Because he was dressed in all black, uh, uh, all silver, I guess. I did, and he was wearing into earrings and you know all those things. He was, and she was into that kind of stuff. I didn't have the right dress. So that's another thing to bring up. So that was my only quote <coughs> failure. But it wasn't failure because I was uh, lack of psychic powers. Okay. So I th think I've said enough for now. I think. I, we'll I just have a question. Sure. Um, uh, we have about uh, eight minutes remaining. Can you tease out the difference between personal validation and subjective validation? Yes, I will. Thank you. Okay, he, uh, the question I got was the difference between personal validation and subjective validation. Uh, the word personal validation comes from the work of Fora. That's what he titled his paper, The Fallacy of Personal Validation. And it was a simple concept. All I want to say is that if you depend upon the person who's getting the reading or getting the personality test result, their reaction for your measure of the accuracy of the, of the instrument or how the instrument's working, that is wrong. That's completely wrong. And that, his demonstration says that. And, but if you think about it, when we say, does this work, it doesn't, does psychic readings work? And do personality tests work? Almost all the evidence we use is the reaction of the person getting the reading, right? So that's, so if you're depending on personal validation for these things, this is why both psychic readings and unfortunately personality test results uh, are probably not, for the most part, very useful things. It's very hard to get, to get accurate personality testing anyways. Uh, they're getting better at it, but still, uh, to the extent that most psychologists and most people believe in readings, uh, the, the personality tests work and the readings especially uh, projective tests, and, and they, uh, people who believe in psychic readings, they depend upon personal validation. That, that's a no-no, I mean, that's, that's, that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because of one of the things is subjective validation. Subjective validation is used not to, dis to describe the process of, I mean, who you ask the source of your validity, validation, but uh, the psychological factors they get into when you're subjectively evaluating something. And we saw this with TARG, and we saw this with uh, other things. When people uh, subjectively uh, try to evaluate how good a reading was that they got, all kinds of interesting psychological things get involved. And uh, uh, all the psychological things we're talking about, how people uh, assimilate to what they already know and how they can fit it to what they're looking for and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's the difference. Subjective validation is we're not describing a, sub a psychological process. Personal, per personal validation simply is a te uh, of describing the way you, who, way you went to get for your source of validation. Can you explain that last one? What's that? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last one? Yeah. Personal validation simply is, dis is, a, is saying uh, when instead of uh, going to some other source like some uh, judges and stuff like that to judge whether a personality result I is accurate or not, you don't go to the person whom it was aimed at. You ask him, did that fit you or not? So psychics 
themselves get a lot of validation and they can believe that they're real because their clients that's true. frequently say, wow, that was amazing. That's true. Now, Even if it wasn't happening. That's right. And now, I've been in, I used to be a member of the, of the Psychic Entertainers Association and a lot of people do mentalism. They also like to think they can do cold readings as well. And um, each one who does cold reading thinks he or she is a guru of some sort because when they do their readings, they get these wonderful reactions from people. And um, when people in the Psychic Entertainers Association learned that I was also a member of Psychop and a skeptic, they got very paranoid about me. And they began uh, attacking me and saying that I was a, a spy or I was a mole about to uh, expose them. Now the first thing that, that I have to tell you is that doing psychic readings has nothing to do with mentalism. Mentalists like to think they, they know something about psychic readings that's somehow good to them. That has nothing to do with it. Doing psychic readings is, 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 competi is people competing with uh, psychologists. And it, it's a, you're playing with fire, you're dealing. And it has nothing to do with entertainment, believe me. If, you, if someone's coming to you suicidal and wants to get a reading, this is not entertainment. So mentors who, uh, are very confused people, okay. And um, so we will go, and now we, we will get to the next lecture where we're going to get into, again, how people go wrong, and then the final lecture, which will wrap everything up.